In the last video, I provided an introduction to the layout of the vulnerability and exploit markets. In this video, I wanted to provide some additional details and thoughts regarding essentially how these markets operate. Uh, so first of all, as you noticed, the price for a vulnerability can vary quite considerably from hundreds of dollars all the way to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, what explains this tremendous uh, fluctuation in price? Uh, well, the short answer is that it correlates in many ways with how valuable knowledge of that vulnerability is to the person who's buying it. And if you look at the videos that I made on vulnerabilities and exploits, uh, especially the earlier ones, I did lay out a number of criteria for determining the severity of a vulnerability, the severity of a vulnerability. And it turns out that these criteria can also be applied to vulnerability pricing as well. Uh, for example, a vulnerability on a software application that is in wide use would be worth a lot more than a vulnerability on an application that's not so widespread. A vulnerability that provides the attacker with greater access to a particular resource is going to be worth a lot more than a vulnerability that provides restricted access. Now on the flip side, the value of a vulnerability can be highly, highly price sensitive. Price sensitive. And the reason for this price sensitivity is that someone else could discover the vulnerability in the meanwhile. And as soon as that happens, the vulnerability no longer becomes an exclusive commodity. Instead, if knowledge of a vulnerability becomes public, the price that it can command essentially drops to zero. Now, given this tight relationship between the price that a vulnerability can command and how secret it is, some buyers are actually willing to provide a bonus, a bonus to sellers so long as the vulnerability that they purchased remains undiscovered. Uh, that means that complex vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that appear harder to discover, these vulnerabilities are likely going to be worth a lot more to a particular seller and also in many ways to a particular buyer. There are also more complex pricing models in place. For example, some suppliers charge potential buyers a subscription fee uh, just for the privilege of being able to browse their catalog. So the idea is that the supplier has a catalog of vulnerabilities, the buyers must pay a fee just to be able to browse that catalog and then if they're interested in any particular vulnerability, they can pay an additional fee on top of the subscription to get access to perhaps exploit code for that vulnerability. It's also important to keep in mind that the buyer doesn't just get information associated with a vulnerability. Uh, the buyer may be provided with things like uh, documentation or with uh, things like uh, customer support uh, in addition to exploit code for a vulnerability. And you know that might come as a surprise to some people, but the reality is that these sellers, they aren't fly-by-night operations. Uh, they're very much real businesses in many cases, and they operate like real businesses. They provide things like documentation and support for their products. You know, their products just happen to be vulnerabilities and exploits, but they behave like legitimate businesses in other aspects. On a related note, sellers have to deal with the challenge of how to uh, disclose information about their vulnerabilities to buyers, but without actually incurring a loss in the process. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? Well, when you think about it, a vulnerability uh, is a piece of detail, it's an intangible piece of detail regarding a particular software application. Uh, so the seller has to somehow convince a buyer that they have this vulnerability that is worth buying. Uh, but in the process of, of perhaps revealing details regarding the vulnerability, the seller then runs the risk that the buyer can fill in the remaining details on its own, in which case the buyer might decide that they won't pay the seller anything. Now this issue I think comes up more generally in the context of situations in which you're dealing with information goods, and obviously a vulnerability or an exploit, that's really a type of information good, but it is a risk that these sellers have to incur. Uh, it's very possible that just by revealing that there is a vulnerability in the first place by revealing maybe what kind of vulnerability it is or maybe where that vulnerability is located, even if that information is given in general terms, uh, the buyer can now kind of narrow his search space or her search space and find that particular vulnerability by looking in the right places. So in many ways, any information that you reveal about that vulnerability is worth a lot to the buyer, but the buyer may not give a payment right away. They may be able to take that information and use it for their own good. 
So as you can start to imagine, uh, pricing can complex, uh, transactions can quickly get quite complex. The whole process is, is quite difficult in many cases, and it may be hard for buyers and sellers to just connect with each other at a baseline. Now, as typical markets start to get more complex, that basic model of just having a seller and a buyer pretty much goes out the window. Instead, you start to require additional parties as well as buyers and sellers. And in, in many cases, you might need intermediaries. In the context of the vulnerability and exploit markets, there are intermediaries. They're typically referred to as brokers. And brokers basically help facilitate transactions between buyers and sellers. They basically facilitate that deal. And in return for their effort, in return for pairing a buyer with a seller, uh, they are given some type of a payment. Typically, it's a commission. And that commission might be something like a certain percentage of the sale, like maybe 10% of the sale, in exchange for basically helping to broker this deal. Now, brokers also provide value in these transactions because they can help to safeguard the identities of the parties involved in the transaction. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, buyers and sellers of vulnerabilities and exploits will often want to be especially, especially discreet about their activities. Having a third party in place who can act as an intermediary, that third party can basically help provide that additional level of discretion. Now, this level of discretion does create new issues. Uh, in particular, uh, buyers don't know sellers, sellers won't know about buyers, buyers don't know if sellers will behave as they're supposed to. Uh, for example, what if a seller sells the same vulnerability to multiple distinct buyers? In that case, the buyers might have paid a lot of money for a good that turned out to have a lot less value because as soon as you reveal a vulnerability to multiple parties, its value goes down. It's no longer secret or exclusive or anything of that nature. So as you can see, these markets are fairly complex in nature. They have many, many unresolved issues. But hopefully this video series and the video before it as well gave you a good understanding of the vulnerability and exploit markets as well as their ramifications.